Thank you very much, Chief Femi Fani Kayode, for being a part of this program. We always enjoy you being on the program. Now, let's start from uh, the president's broadcast. What do you think about the president's broadcast? Well, I, I enunciated my views um, about the broadcast in an essay that I titled, I wrote titled um, The Morning Broadcast, The President's Morning Broadcast, or something like that. So, um, if your viewers would take the um, time to just Google it. It's all over the, the place. Um, my views are clearly enunciated there. Um, but, but just, to, just to, you know, to try to put it in a nutshell, uh, I felt it was shallow. I felt it was divisive. I felt that it was um, very arrogant in many ways, talking down to Nigerians, issuing threats, um, telling them that certain things are settled law uh, because he had discussed it with um, the great chief, Ujuku, allegedly discussed it with the great dim, uh, Emeka Ujuku, many years ago, um, drawing red lines against the media, um, basically insulting Nigerians and making it look as if we have no right whatsoever to think um, or to say what we wish to think or say. Um, at a time when the first thing you ought to have done was to apologize for the fact that for almost three, 350 days out of the 700 days he's been in power, uh, he's been away. Uh, for medical reasons, undisclosed strange ailments that we apparently have no right to know um, the nature uh, of whatever it is that's worrying him or that's ailing him. Uh, he's been away for almost 350 days. And the last one, as everybody knows, was 105 days in a stretch. So I would have thought the first thing he would do uh, would be to apologize for the fact that he has been away and that we have become the butt of jokes in the international community. And then secondly, to try to build bridges uh, between um, the various people in this country, divisions which he caused by his policies uh, and, his, uh, and, and his attitude and the attitude of members of his government over the last two and a half years. We didn't see that. There was no attempt to heal the wounds. There was no attempt to make Nigerians feel loved. There was no attempt to behave like a servant leader. What I saw was an attempt to behave like a conquering emperor, uh, a military dictator, a caliph, a king, um, with divine rights, talking down to our people. And I felt it was unhelpful, to say the least. Um, and I feel he could have done a lot better uh, than he did. Now, do you think those words were the president's words? Because um, a lot of persons have been asking questions. How come uh, the president is talking like this? Well, whether he wrote it or not, he has to be accountable for the words that are there. Um, but in, I have no doubt in my mind that the president is not the Buhari that left our country or that came to power two and a half years ago. Um, this is not the same man. Uh, this is another Buhari, which is what informed my position earlier when I said that um, the president would never come back. The president that I know, that you know, is not back. What, what, we, what we have is a shell of a president who is evidently too weak to do anything. And like I said earlier, he came back to the country um, as a consequence of a one-night protest in London because he was so embarrassed by what the international community would say. And he was shocked at the fact that the London police, Metropolitan Police, gave permission for protests to take place outside Abuja House in London. He was embarrassed by that. They hurled all manner of insults at him because... Is, they this, is this true or you're just assuming? I saw it. I saw the video. And um, there's a gentleman by the name of Enahuru and a group of other resign or resume our Mumudondu group who, who staged this protest. And I mean, it was a very vigorous protest in the tradition of every democracy in the world, apart from the Nigerian democracy, where they would probably have been tear gassed or shot or sprayed with water cannons. But of course, you're, you're in a civilized country. They allowed them to voice their views. They had police permission and they were hurling all kinds of um, counsel to him through the middle of the night. And it, it troubled the president to the extent that he sent people outside uh, to say, look, the president is trying to sleep and um, let him sleep. And of course, they said, no, we will not let him sleep. He will be tormented by our words until he sees fit to resign or to go home. The following morning, President Buhari packed his bags and came running home. Um, that's not the president we knew before. Uh, this is the new Buhari who lacks courage and who simply can be easily shaken by those that are opposed to him. He got back here. He got to the airport. The first thing he did, if you look at the footage, he got out of the plane he went to the left side of the plane, raised his fist, clenched fist salute, to a crowd of people that were not there. They were right on the other side. You could hardly see them in the picture. And he was with the vice president. If you look at it, I challenge you to go and study it. Something very wrong with that. And even the security details looked rather surprised that he would do that. 
After that, it didn't stop there. He got on the podium. They played the national anthem. They had they had they had pushed out and um, put together the um, you know a military a military parade for him, military, which he was supposed to inspect the guard of honor to honor him. The Buhari that came back was too weak to do that. He couldn't even inspect his own guard of honor. He immediately left them and they went back to the so he, 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 What I'm saying is that it's not the same man. And what I'm saying is that Buhari is weak. Buhari is unfit to lead. Buhari is a very sick man. Buhari shouldn't be leading our country. He went, you know, the next thing that he did, he promised to do a broadcast to the Nigerian people. He was too weak to do uh, a live broadcast because anything could have happened. He could have had a heart attack. He could have coughed. Anything could have happened during that live broadcast because he's so ill. So what did they do? He did a recorded broadcast, which is what we discussed earlier. A very shallow, empty, nonsensical broadcast insulting the intelligence of the Nigerian people and talking down to us and threatening us. Now, it didn't stop there. He couldn't go to the office the following day because he was too ill. And what did they tell Nigerians? That rats and rodents had taken over his office and that um, he couldn't go to the office as a consequence of that. Um, you know, well, you know, the last time I heard about such things was when, um, you know, Balaam, the biblical Balaam, was spoken to by a donkey. God used a donkey to talk to Balaam it's in God the Bible. The God clearly used the rats to talk to Buhari and drove him from his office. And like I said earlier, if I may, like I said earlier, the last time animals drove, the last time Buhari was driven out of his office was in 1985 by military officers. Now in 2017, he's being driven out of his office by rats. And that tells you something. It didn't stop there. The day after that, he was meant to um, chair Federal Council meeting. And we were told that the meeting was canceled because he had to receive a report on, uh, on the investigative committee on the um, Secretary of Federal Government and the former DG of um, NIA. Um, I don't see why he couldn't receive the report and do the meeting, but it's very clear he wasn't well enough to handle the meeting. See, I am surprised you're saying this because a lot of um, his media team, his handlers were in the UK. They went to see him when he was in the hospital. And they came back to Nigeria to tell Nigerians that the president is fit and is ready to resume. And now he was telling us that the president is feeble, is weak. Uh, and they also made us understand that the doctors, uh, in fact, they certified him fit to rule. Now, the Buhari that came on Saturday was a Buhari that was not well enough to come back. It was a Buhari that... But the doctors certified him fit. That's what they told you. Have you spoken to the doctor? Have you seen the reports? I don't believe anything this government tells me. If Lai Mohammed told me that it was day outside, I'd have to assume that it was night. Do you really believe that? You saw the man. You're not a doctor, neither am I. But you saw the man. You saw the fact that he couldn't, he couldn't um, chair a council meeting. You saw the fact that he couldn't do a live broadcast. You saw the fact that he was clenching his fist and waving at a non-existent crowd. You saw the fact that he claims that rodents and rats had driven him from his office so he couldn't go there. You saw these things. You heard these things. We all did. And you think the man is well enough? Let me tell you something that may shock you. The night that he saw... Pastor Adiboy, a great man of God, yeah. um, that went to see him in London, I think a couple of nights before he came. I am, nights before he came. Sure. I'm pretty certain. I may be wrong. I wasn't there. Um, but from all the reports I've had, from those that should be in the know, and believe me, I do know some people around them, uh, he didn't give Pastor Adiboy the slightest impression that he was going to be traveling. Yeah. None whatsoever. It came as a shock to even the vice president, indeed to everybody, that just literally, you know, in the early hours of the morning, he said he's coming back the following day, or I think the night before, he said he's coming. And that's why they issued that rush statement. They were all shocked. Why? Because the Mumu Dondu movement had done a very good job. And I commend them for their courage. What a small group of people can do throughout the international community in various na uh, national capitals. Are credit for the return of the president? I most certainly am. I have no doubt the president would not have come back had it not been for the fact that he was harassed out of London by the voices, the loud voices, the resounding voices of a small group of people that represented the overwhelming majority of Nigerians throughout the world. Now let's talk about the peace and unity of Nigeria, the broadcast of restructuring. Yeah. The president, we expected him to return from the UK and tell Nigerians uh, things about restructuring, some things that can put a stop to these uh, agitations and uh, call for cessation in Nigeria. But what do you think? Did, did the president even do the right you thing? I think it's made the divisions worse. His speech has um, 
has has widened the fault lines even more than they were. He's, they have caused more division. They have his words have hurt more people, and his policies have caused more division than any other president in the history of our country. And that is a fact. Even Gawan, who was a wartime uh, um, head of state, tried his best to be careful with the things he said during the civil war. But this man has come back. He has insulted the Nigerian people. He has threatened us. He spoke for less than five minutes. Yes, indeed. Less than five minutes. And he told us that we had no right whatsoever to discuss certain issues. He rejected the concept of restructuring. He rejected the concept of, of self-determination. Now, Chief, what were you expecting the president to say in his broadcast? You are not happy about all that he has said. No. I expected the president to be a statesman, to first apologize and emphasize the fact that as a democratically elected leader, he should be a servant leader that is accountable to the people. And I expect him to account for what happened to him over the last 105 days. I also expect him to account for the fact that under his watch, the Nigerian people are badly divided. We didn't have this kind of agitation for Biafra before he came on board. We, it was never as pronounced as it, as it is today. He has lost control. We never had a situation where the Arewa uh, youths will get up and threaten Igbo people and tell them to leave and threaten them with genocide if they don't leave by October the 1st. It's never happened and nothing happened to them. We've never had a situation where Fulani herdsmen will go all over the country, Middle Belt in the South and the North, slaughtering people um, as, if it was, as if it was the normal thing for, for people to do. These people are barbarians and they were killing Nigerian people. Not one of them has been arrested, not one of them has been convicted. We've never had a situation where Ududua Republic, where young men, sensible young men, who, who, who have just had enough, will get up, Yoruba boys will get up and say, we must break off from Nigeria, and um, we must now, if we are attacked by the North, we should exterminate the Norths with chemical weapons. A young man by the name of Ade Inka Grandson said that. I saw, it on, I saw it on YouTube about two weeks ago. It was never like that before. And I don't accept uh, his view that anybody should be uh, gassed with chemical weapons. But I fully appreciate and understand his frustrations. We've never had a situation where the Niger Deltans will say, or a group of Niger Delta militants will say the Northerners and the Yorubas should leave the Niger Delta by October the 1st. We've never had a situation where you have every single security agency in this country, a blessed country, a multi-religious, multi ethnic multicultural country where you have every single security agency manned by a northern Muslim except for one which is the Navy we've never had all these are these are strange and new things to us and, and what Buhari has done is that he has given us all this created this division and now they're trying to tell us that we have no right to criticize them they want to impose a culture of silence they want to intimidate and threaten us and they want to say if you do do anything well, say see. anything out of it we Chief, will deal with you Chief. and we are ready for that the, the president came back and said that he read everything through the social media and he was not happy in fact he was depressed mm -hmm. with the things he he read through the social media about nigeria and he also made a statement that those words crossed the red lines mm -hmm. and he said Anyone, he has given the military the marching order yes. uh, to take up any troublemaker, mm. anyone found yeah. uh, uh, indulging in hate speeches, mm. and anybody that wants to divide the country. Mm. What do you think? The architects of hate speech are the very people that are talking about hate speech now. First, how do you define hate speech? If I criticize the government, is that hate speech? They should trap. You see, these people are very limited. I'm sorry to say, not very well educated. And, and, and essentially, it's a fascistic dictatorial approach to governance. PDP never did that. Anybody could say anything. The worst we would do, I was spokesman for Abbas Ojo, as you know, for a number of years. The worst thing we would do is respond to you vigorously. We don't lock people up. We don't threaten. We won't say it's hate speech because we say we don't like Abbas Ojo's face or because you say Jonathan's wife is this, that, and the other. You don't like Jonathan. Jonathan is clear. We don't call that hate speech. We call it free speech and we respond in any way that we choose to, with our own words. And we clarify the position. Well, you know that words at times can even cause war. You they can. happen in a world war. Which is, which is precisely why, I agree with you, which yes. is precisely why we, and that's a fair point, but that is precisely why we warned against this practice, if you remember, when we were in government and the APC started. When you say the, that if you lose an election, baboons and dogs the, the, you know, the, the blood of baboons and dogs will flow. When you say that you will impose Sharia law in every state of the Federation, when you say that Muslims should only vote for Muslims, when you say things like um, Jonathan is clueless and his wife looks like an illiterate hippo hippopotamus, when you say all manner of insults 
that, you know, I, I don't want to repeat some of the th horrific things that they said. When you say that you get on international media and you tell them that you, you, you're only going to help the 95% that supported you, the 5%, you're not going to do anything for meaning the evil people. Those are its speeches. Of course, because what you're doing is that you are identifying a group of people an ethnic group or a religious group, you are targeting them for persecution and you're setting them up for violence. That is unacceptable. You will never hear, at least most of us, will never say, kill people from whatever part of the country or deal with people from... That is wrong. In an but but, but, but crit a legitimate criticism of the government is the lifeblood of democracy. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to shut that down. You know why? Because they failed so badly in terms of the economy, in terms of national cohesion, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, decency, in terms of honesty, in every way. And now they don't want people to talk about it and they want to come up with this label of hate speech. When Oshibajo gets up, as he regularly does, a lawyer, a professor of law, a man that I've always had so much respect for, and a pastor of the Redeemed Church of God, a great church, a great member of the body of Christ, will get up and call everybody that's accused of anything looters over and over again. That's you call that's... people looters, and you, don't, and you don't call that hate speech? NLC held a, an event in Abuja, and uh, people like the Sahad Abubakar, uh, the Sultan of Sokoto, uh, former governor of um, Edo State, Oshomole, they were all there. Oshomole pointed out that this crap, and talk about restructuring began after 2015 election. And it, those who lost out of the election are the ones that are propagating this restructuring thing. Yeah. First of all, let me just say that um, Governor Adams Oshimole is a personal friend of mine. I've always liked him. I always had respect for him. And he's somebody I have a soft spot for. I, uh, I'm very reluctant to respond in the way that I ought to respond to that because I happen to like him. Um, we don't agree politically at all, um, but, but, but I have some respect for him based on his record in the past. Now, but I must tell you that what he has said is, you know, disingenuous and absurd. Uh, first of all, the agitation of restructuring started in the 40s in this country uh, and became more pronounced as each decade passed. Uh, it became exceptionally strong uh, after the June 12th, 1993 election was nullified, um, and it became stronger under Abacha. Uh, ever since that time, each government that has come into power has had to, you know, address this question to v in varying degrees. But we didn't hear Jonathan's, that during the, during the Jonathan's... I assure you, I was in Obasanjo's government. Yes. If you remember, Obasanjo set up uh, a national conference. Unfortunately, it was tied to third term. But if you look at all the agitation, you see that a lot of these things were argued and agreed on in terms of devolution and so on and so Even though Obasanjo was a bastion against restructuring, and he probably still is because he's a conservative man who sees things in a very different way and a different light to you and I do. And I can appreciate and understand his views. He's entitled to them. That, that was a step in the right direction that he took. To even talk about national conference, he did that. Unfortunately, he went out of the window because it was all tied to third term. Jonathan came into power, and if you remember, he set up a constitutional conference which came up with clear recommendations, which essentially spoke about devolution, spoke to those issues, everybody was happy, everybody agreed on it, and part of his campaign promises was that if he were elected back into office, he would implement that fully. And of course, he never came back to office. The first thing the P APC government did when they came in was say, you know, Buhari said he doesn't understand the meaning of the word restructuring, and he essentially threw uh, the whole report in the dustbin and we're now back to square one. And now they are trying to label everybody that believes in restructuring and says restructuring is the only way forward to preserve the unity of our country as criminals, as illiterates, and as political opportunists. And I reject that uh, categorization. And I say that instead of doing things like they should sit up, smell the coffee, and understand the Nigeria of today is different to the Nigeria of yesterday. We need good leadership, strong leadership, credible leadership that will devolve power from the center, restructure the country, move our nation forward as one. And if we refuse to do that, I have no doubt whatsoever. But it's just a question of time before this country disintegrates. And that would be a tragedy. Let me just, let me just add this. He also said that everybody, reportedly said, that everybody that believes in restructuring, they're just members of the opposition yes, group. Right? Yes. Well, again, this is absurd and nonsensical. I'm sorry to use those words about my friend, uh, but to describe what my friend said, but that's the bitter truth. Uh, is President Babangida a member of the opposition? 
is Atiku a member of the opposition? Is the revered and honored Babadi Banjo of Afeni Fere and all the leaders of Afeni Fere members of the opposition? Are the leaders of the OPC members of the opposition? Are the Niger Delta elders members of the opposition? Is Ohai Neze are they members of the opposition? Are the Middle Belt Forum leaders members of the opposition? Are T.Y. Danjuma and uh, the revered um, um, uh, Chief Solomon La, the, the, the chairman of the Christian Elders Forum, are they also part of the opposition? I mean, it is absurd. And, and, and it won't work. Let me take you back to the president's speech where he said it is only the National Assembly and the National Council of States that had that have the legitimate right to discuss national issues. Mm. And a little person frowned at that statement. Mm. What do you think? Does that seem like the, the words of a normal person to you? The president is This normal. is what the president, clearly the president is not himself. The president is not normal. I've told you already, the Buhari that came back is not the Buhari that left. He's not in, he, he, he has left he has left the, he has left the spirit of Buhari that is the warrior the Buhari that was a worthy adversary a man that we disagreed with but that we revered the great hero of Chad that pushed the Libyan supported Chadians back and almost took the capital of Chad but, but don't you this think was this age was is no 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 that. no no because Obasanjo is older and others are older than him Babangida is almost the same age. You won't hear that kind of garbage from them, for goodness sake. So and it is, advice my, advi my advice to the president is to resign. I don't ask him to resign. Why? I demand for him to resign. Why he demand? is too old. He is too weak. What about Mugabe, if you're talking about his Mugabe age? Mugabe has to. Look at Zimbabwe as a consequence of Mugabe. And, and, and that is, again, a great civil war hero. That is Mugabe, a man that did so much to push the whites out of power and introduce majority rule, has now become a caricature and a joke of the international community. Is that what we want for Nigeria? You, so, you, you, you just quoted a part of the speech, quite rightly, that only the National Assembly. So the media are not supposed to dialogue about it. Nigerians are not supposed to discuss issues about self-determination and whether or not we want to remain together. Nigerians are not supposed to discuss restructuring. Clearly, there's an element of um, what I'll probably describe as dementia involved here. And I don't say this to insult. I say this to advise. And I say those that truly love President Muhammadu Buhari, that truly love him, will say, look, it's enough. Let us ask him to resign honorably. Go home and take care of his health. Let his family enjoy him for whatever number of years he has left. And let somebody else take the levers of power and lead Nigeria. We're not happy with the fact that it would be Oshibajo because constitutionally it would be him. Yeah. But let him be there so that we can fire the arrows at him and we can take him on man to man. It's difficult for us to take on a man that they once described as a Lion King, but now is not a Lion King, but is a weak, weak lion that is his dying days. And, and I'll tell you what, that rats and rodents can dictate to and can drive out of his office. We don't yeah, want that for you, Nigeria. You didn't believe in that statement, so a lot of persons... But they said it, so I have to take them at their word. We know it's not true. Chief, Chief on this program, we always come on for the unity of Nigeria. We always want to find a solution to this cry, to these agitations from different regions. Because somebody like me, I do not want Nigeria to be divided. But we want a Nigeria that is fair, a Nigeria that is, that has, that is just, a Nigeria that can accommodate everyone as brothers and sisters. Now, what is, in your own words, what do you think and how do you think we can achieve what we are clamoring for? And is restructuring really going to be the solution to some of this problem? Well, first of all, let me start with the last thing you said. I'm a believer in Nigeria, but I think it's the height of arrogance to say the unity of Nigeria is not negotiable. That is the opinion of somebody. Others may have other opinions. I happen to believe that we ought to renegotiate uh, to ensure that Nigeria remains one. That's the way forward. And that renegotiation embraces the whole concept of restructuring, devolution of power, resource control, ethnic emancipation, secular state, and so many other things. We need to sit down and talk about, it, have that discussion, and agree on the terms under which we should remain together. And I believe passionately in that. That's the way forward. And if we can do that, if we can see sense and good sense prevails, I assure you we will remain together. The danger is that if we don't view the, 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 the consequences of, of, of not doing that, 
then we're not being fair to ourselves. In other words, if we close our eyes and say that, oh, nothing will happen if we continue the way we're going, then you're not a patriot, you're not a believer in unity. These issues are not settled, but they can be settled. But if they are not settled and we continue the way we're going, I assure you the worst may happen, and nobody wants that. I'd like to say thank you for being a part of Pleasure. the program. <laughs> uh, we do hope that um, we'll, when we invite you again, thank you, very you much. will oblige it's us. A pleasure. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Chief Femi Fani Kayode, a former Minister of Aviation and the former spokesperson of the Jonathan uh, campaign organization during the 2015 election. He has said a lot about restructuring and why uh, we need to uh, keep talking about it. And until we get it right, Nigeria will not remain Nigeria. And he also said so much about the president and his health, which anyway, I, I may not agree with him for, for some of his points, but I think he has made his point that, and he has demanded the resignation of President Mohamed Buhari. Until we come back on this program, do have a wonderful day. <laughs>